Hello and welcome everyone to BioRad's webinar series on Droplet Digital PCR. This is our fifth webinar in a series of six BioRad is hosting on DDPCR. My name is Mohini Patil and I'm the Global Product Manager for Droplet Digital PCR at BioRad and your host for today's webinar. First, let's discuss the webinar logistics. The webinar will last approximately one hour. Dr. Jan Juvenot will present on DDPCR and its application in gene expression and microRNA analysis for about 45 minutes. Following the presentation, we will have 15 minutes of live questions and answers with Jan. Throughout the webinar, feel free to use the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen in order to submit your DDPCR questions directly to us. We will get to as many of your questions as we have time for. However, if we cannot get to your question today, we will personally follow up with you over the next few weeks. Also, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A box to report them. Now, a little bit about our speaker, Dr. Jan Juvenot. Dr. Juvenot earned his PhD in human genetics from the University of Paris. Jan completed his postdoctoral studies at Sangamo Biosciences. Dr. Juvenot is currently a staff scientist at BioRad's Digital Biology Center, working on the development of various applications. The title of Dr. Juvenot's talk this morning is Enabling High-Resolution Gene Expression and MicroRNA Analysis with DDPCR. Without further ado, let's get started. Jan? Thanks a lot for your introduction, Mohini. As uh, it was mentioned, today I would like to discuss the following items. First of all, I'd like to start with a brief introduction on the digital PCR platform, the QX200, as well as the principles behind digital PCR and its unique characteristics. I'll also present a few ways in which DDPCR has been used to study gene expression and how it has, it has complemented existing approaches. I'll also discuss <coughs> the the biology behind miRNA, the roles, and the ways in which DDPCR has been used to study them. Finally, I'd like to introduce some approaches for multiplexing with Evergreen and the different uses it can have for DDPCR studies. First of all, here is BioRad's QX200 droplet digital PCR system. It consists of two instruments, the droplet generator and the droplet reader. BioRad offers all the necessary reagents to perform digital PCR in droplets. The droplet generator uses a disposable DG8 cartridge to simultaneously partition eight independent 20 microliter reactions into 20,000 droplets each, all in about two minutes. The droplet reader instrument can read a full 96 well plate in about two and a half hours. The system gives its user of great flexibility by allowing for a broad range of sample throughput. Also, by empowering the user to decide how many samples to run from one to several hundred samples can be analyzed in a single workday. At the core, Droplet Digital PCR, or DDPCR, is a revolutionary new technology that allows for precise and absolute quantification of nucleic acids. There are essentially three simple steps prior to receiving quantitative results. First, the partitioning step, where a standard 20 microliter PCR reaction containing sample, master mix, and assay, or primers and probes, is divided into about 20,000 uniform nanoliter sized droplets by the droplet generator instrument. Second, the droplets are transferred to a 96 well plate and thermal cycle to a point, which is usually about 40 cycles. For the third and final step, the thermal cycle plate is placed in the droplet reader instrument, where the droplets are counted individually from each well by fluorescence to provide a positive or negative result. The data is then displayed in the system software, QuantaSoft, and it results as a concentration in, of, in copies of target per microliter of reaction. This massive partitioning of a PCR reaction affords a number of powerful technical advantages. First of all, 
TDPCR provides an absolute measurement in copies per microliter. One no longer has to extrapolate CQs onto a standard curve in order to obtain a relative quantification. DDPCR will literally count the numbers of molecules present. Second, DDPCR enables sensitive detection of rare events, since partitioning reduces the relative PCR competition between species and allows for a better representation of minority transcripts. Third, because each droplet will give a yes or no answer, DDPCR is much more tolerant to, of PCR inhibitors than any other quantitative method. Finally, and of particular importance for gene expression, high precision means the ability to resolve smaller differences in absolute target numbers. This enables quantification of more subtle changes in gene expression in homogeneous samples, as well as the detection of gene expression variations in very heterogeneous samples. Regarding gene expression analysis, what is usually understood by gene expression analysis is the study of RNA molecules or transcripts in biological samples. These studies are usually performed by combining the detection of a target gene and a reference gene for the same sample. The reference gene, which is often a housekeeping gene, is used to normalize the amount of input material, and the ratio of target over reference is used to compare samples among themselves. The study of microRNA miRNA also falls under the umbrella of gene expression studies, although these transcripts do not properly code for a protein, but play an important role in regulating the expression of other genes. Finally, an emerging and growing body of research centers around the study of gene expression at the single cell level. DDPCR is an extremely powerful tool for single cell transcriptomics, a field where material is, by definition, limited and when, where most of the targets are present in very low quantities. In this table, we will display a comparison of different methods for gene expression analysis. Each method comes with its set of specific, uh, specific pros and cons. Methods such as microarrays or RNA-seq allow for study of a large number of targets and are fantastic discovery tools. However, their cost and throughput make it hard to expand their use for testing of large numbers of samples. While QRT-PCR has a low cost and high throughput, it also lacks precision and is not well suited for characterization of changes below twofold. DDPCR, on the other hand, offers an unparalleled sensitivity combined with a high throughput and the capacity for absolute quantification. This makes it extremely well suited for studies on limited number of targets, up to four per well, on a large number of samples. It is also a great tool for detection and quantification of alternate species, single cell transcriptomics, and low abundance targets. I will now discuss a few results that have been published in the literature over the past year or so. In this uh, publication by Dr. Belyakova and her collaborators, the scientists explore the effects of cell isolation on gene expression. Multiple scientific disciplines require the isolation of specific subsets of blood cells from patient samples, and they do this for gene expression analysis by either microarray or RNA sequencing or other methods. One essential concern during these isolation steps is the prevention of disease or treatment-related signatures loss. However, very little is known with respect of the impact of different cell isolation methods on gene expression and the effects of positive selection, negative selection, and fluorescence activated cell sorting, or FACs. This have not been assessed in parallel in the past. To address this knowledge gap, CD41 T cells, CD81 T cells, B cells, and monocytes were isolated from blood samples of five independent donors using either positive immunomagnetic selection, negative immunomagnetic selection, and facts. The gene expression profiles were subsequently analyzed by microarray and DDPCR. pcr 
To validate gene expression by a method independent of microarrays, the following three genes were selected for DDPCR confirmation, SP1, SPI1, sorry, CD14, and SDPR. These allow the scientists to determine which methods led to significant differences in expression patterns, and to conclude that FACTS was the least disruptive method of the three. In this case, the levels of change in gene expression would have been undetected by other methods, such as QRT-PCR. This is illustrated by the confidence with which the different populations are discriminated, and allow the scientists to prove, by studying the differences in SDPR levels, that a platelet contamination persisted in a negatively selected monocyte population. This can be seen on the bottom chart. In the next article by Dr. Belzeal and her team, the authors studied the epigenetic regulation of a gene involved in different neurodegenerative diseases. Individuals carrying GGGC uh, expanded repeats of the C9ORF72 um, gene represent a significant portion of a patient suffering from ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and FTD, or frontotemporal dementia. Elucidating how this expanded repeats cause FTD or ALS has since become an important goal of the field. To this end, the authors sought to investigate whether epigenetic changes are responsible for the decrease in C9 ORF72 expression levels observed in the patients. They performed a variety of assays on clinical samples and tested the expression of different C9 ORF72 transcripts. What they found was that while QRT-PCR was able to provide answers for some of the most common transcripts, this could not be applied to transcript 1, which is a rarer form for that gene. The scientists then decided to use DDPCR, which allowed them to visualize significant differences between patients containing the sequence expansion and other groups in the cerebellum. As can be seen in this chart, the differences are seen on extremely low numbers of transcripts, a few molecules per well. This really illustrates the power of DDPCR for precise quantification of targets at the very low end. In the third article, we will approach the theme of RNA editing. RNA editing is a post-transcriptional process, which has been the object of increasing attention over the past years. In this publication, the authors fo focus on one of the enzymes involved in RNA editing. Adenosine deaminases acting on RNA, or ADARs, convert adenosine to inosine, which is then recognized as guanosine. To study the role of ADAR proteins in RNA editing and gene regulation, the authors sequenced and compared the DNA and RNA of human B cells. Then, they followed up the findings um, experimentally with sRNA knockdown and RNA and protein immunoprecipitations. The results uncovered over 60,000 A to G editing sites and several thousand genes whose expression levels are influenced by ADARs. In this study, the authors used DDPCR to validate the RNA editing events identified by RNA-seq. It also allowed for precise quantification of said events. This really cements the role of DDPCR as an essential and complementary technology for NGS. This complementarity has emerged as a consistent trend amongst users of the QX system, many of whom use it for validation of NGS preliminary findings. What you see in the charts displayed here are 2D plots for either the genomic DNA or the cDNA from uh, biological samples. In the genomic DNA, you only see one type of allele, the A allele in VIC, but in the cDNA, you observe two types of allele, an A allele and a G allele. And as you can see, the G allele is very minoritary, as reflected by the low number of droplets. MIRNAs are a non-coding RNA 
which that plays a role in the regulation of gene expression and protein stability. These begin as polymerase II express genes that are processed into pre-miRNAs, as can be seen on steps two and three. They are then exported into the cytoplasm, step four, and further processed by DICER, which produces 18 to 21 nucleotide duplexes. These duplexes are recognized by the RISC complex, which unwinds the duplex and binds to target RNAs. If the target RNAs are a perfect match, the mRNA is degraded. If there is a mismatch, the miRNA acts as a translational repressor, preventing protein production. In addition to regulation within a cell, miRNAs can be exported into the blood and lymph systems. <clears throat> as illustrated in this figure, miRNAs have been identified as playing a role in a variety of normal and pathological processes. They are also becoming increasingly prevalent as markers for cancer diagnostics. The relatively short length of miRNA segments lends difficulty to their detection, and various companies have now provided specialized mRNA transcription and detection chemistries to overcome that difficulty. Like I mentioned, several commercial kits are currently available from companies such as Kyogen, Exicon, or Life Technologies. They mainly use poly A tails or stem looped primers during an initial reverse transcription step. This allows to extend the length of the target. A PCR then utilizes an miRNA specific forward primer and a generic reverse primer which is complementary to the tail or the primer that was attached initially. Finally, the target quantification is achieved by Tachman probes or intercalant diet chemistry, such as EVA or CyberGreen. DDPCR can be used for commercially available miRNA assays. In this slide, we can see the 1D plot for the detection of miRNAs 423 and 425 using the kit from Live Technology. This kit uses a Tachman assay. In this type of plot, we measure one type of fluorescence in the y-axis. Here, we can observe a very nice discrimination between the positives and the negative droplets in the samples containing the target cDNA. The controls or NTCs for no template control, do not show a positive population. This figure is just a different illustration of the same result, but this time in a 2D plot. This type of plot allows to visualize both types of fluorescence for one or multiple wells. This is particularly useful when detecting more than one target. Once the cycling conditions are optimized, the assays can be used for target quantification. In this figure, we illustrate the precision of quantification in a serial dilution of the target cDNAs. On the left-hand panel, the detection of miRNA-423 is pushed down to about 20 copies per well, while in the right-hand panel, detection of miRNA-425 is pushed down to just a couple of copies per well. The same assays were then used in both DDPCR and qPCR to detect miRNAs 423 along a dilution curve. On the left panel, we observe the DDPCR results, and we can see that they line up perfectly according to their expected values, while providing an excellent regression value. The R-square value is about 0.9997. By contrast, the qRT-PCR have a less than ideal alignment as well as a much lower level of linearity, in this case, 0.6533. A similar comparison was then done for the miRNA-425 assay. On the left panel, 
The observed DDPCR results line up nicely according to their expected values, while providing an excellent regression value. The R-square here is 0.9981. By contrast, the QRT-PCR have a less optimal alignment, as well as a much lower level of linearity, in this case 0.7696. A similar approach was used to validate the usability of the QX200 DDPCR platform in order to detect miRNAs with intercalant chemistries. Two different assays from two different suppliers, Exocon and Kyogen, were used in combination with BioRat's Evergreen Supermix. The detection of miRNAs SNU6 and 423, as illustrated by the 1D plot in this solution series, seems to work perfectly and provides an excellent discrimination between positive and negative events for both kits and both RNAs. A direct comparison of QRT-PCR and DDPCR for miRNA quantification made the object of this publication by Dr. Henson and collaborators. For this work, the scientists tested six different miRNA assays comparing both methods on serial dilutions, with triplicates for each dilution point. The dilutions were performed both in water and plasma in order to more accurately reflect a clinically relevant situation. In the water mix, DDPCR reduced mean coefficients of variations, or CVs, from 20, 37 to 86% compared to real-time PCR results. This with respect to the overall variation. It also reduced from about 48 to 72% of CVs with respect to PCR-specific variation. DDPCR consistently displayed lower variation than real-time PCR for all miRNAs tested in both plasma and water. And whether calculated across PCR replicates, RT replicates, or serial dilution preparation replicates. As an additional performance metric that cannot be examined using real-time PCR, the authors also noted that absolute measurements by DDPCR corresponded to about 50 to 110 percent of the theoretical input copies, indicating that absolute detection by DDPCR is remarkably efficient. And microRNA 137, or MIR 137, has been shown to play a very important role in the differentiation of neural stem cells. In this article, Dr. Zhang and collaborators used the power of DDPCR to study the expression of this particular mRNA and its involvement in stem cell differentiation. Embryonic stem cells, or ES cells, have the potential to differentiate into different cell types, using, including neurons. However, the contribution of MIR-137 in the maintenance and differentiation of ES cells remains unknown. In this paper, the authors show that MIR-137 is mainly expressed in ES cells at the mitotic phase of the cell cycle and highly upregulated during differentiation. To confirm the expression of MIR-137 in mitotic cells, the authors synchronized ES cells to G2M phases of the cell cycle, and the expression of MIR-137 was determined by two independent methods, qPCR and DDPCR. While qRT-PCR was effective at characterizing large changes in expression levels, such as the over 25-fold difference seen in Figure 1a, DDPCR had to be used to confirm much smaller changes. As shown in Figure 1c, the cells treated with nocodezo or vincristin showed significantly higher MIR-137 expression levels. However, no changes in the levels of MIR-16, a microRNA highly expressed in ES cells, were observed in cells synchronized to G2M phase. This can be seen in Figure 1c. The location of MIR-137 in mitotic cells was confirmed by in situ hybridization and the increased level of MIR-137 in mitotically synchronized cells suggests that MIR-137 
is expressed in a cell cycle dependent manner in ES cells. Finally, employing the recently released and evergreen compatible QX200 platform, scientists at the DBC have been able to show how the fluorescence emission from each droplet directly relates to the mass of DNA encapsulated within. The added resolution associated with partitioning prior to thermal cycling allowed us to exploit this principle to visualize and account for off-target products and enable the quantification of multiple target species in a single well of droplets. In the following publication, Dr. McDermott and his collaborators demonstrated that the results obtained with DNA binding dyes in DDPCR are equivalent to their previously reported TACMAN counterparts, both in precision and dynamic range. In order to differentiate the fluorescence from two different targets, a first strategy explored was to use different primer concentrations. As shown in the left part of the figure, the positive droplets in the RPP30 singleplex reactions, done with 150 nanomolars of primers, have a higher fluorescence than the ones for the MRGPRX1 reaction, done with 50 nanomolars. When combined, the two assays result in four different clusters, which can be seen both in the 1D and 2D plots. As outlined in the figure, the black cluster in the 2D plot corresponds to the negative droplets, the blue cluster to the MRGPRX1 positive droplets, the green one to the RPP30 positive droplets, and finally, the top orange cluster corresponds to the double positive droplets. In this configuration, the lasso tool in Quantasoft must be used to identify each cluster, and it then allows the user to get an accurate quantification for each individual target. This assay configuration was then used to assess the copy number variation for MRGPRX1 in different cell lines. As demonstrated in this chart, the use of duplex assays with evergreen yields a precise and accurate determination of copy numbers for each cell line. Each Coriel cell line DNA here is identified in the x-axis, and the respective copy number is outlined in the y-axis. The data obtained by the Evergreen Multiplex experiments leads to a perfect quantification of both target and reference, aligning, aligning the copy numbers ranging from 1 to 6 with their expected values. Another approach to duplexing Evergreen assays involves the use of different sizes of amplicons. As an intercalant agent, the amount of fluorescence emitted by Evergreen is dependent on the final amount of DNA present. When comparing amplicons of equivalent PCR efficiencies, the longer amplicon will result in a higher fluorescence level. In this case, a 62 nucleotide amplicon, RPP30, is compared to a 137 nucleotide one, beta-actin. The differential fluorescence between the two amplicons, which is illustrated on the left part of the 1D plots, leads to four different clusters when both assays are combined. When the clusters are identified in Quantasoft, the resulting quantification for each target is similar whether the assays are done separately or in duplex. You can see this on the right side, uh, on the C panel on the right. A third approach to duplexing with green utilizes the difference in melting temperatures, or TM, between assays. As previously mentioned, the amount of fluorescence emitted by evergreen is dependent on the final amount of DNA present in the droplets. Assays of similar sizes but different TMs will have different PCR efficiencies when amplified at the same temperature. In the present case, an assay with a TM of 59 degrees UC44 is combined with an assay with a 63 degrees TM IGF1R. The PCR was being run at 63 degrees, which favored the reaction for IGF1R positive droplets. This results in differences in fluorescence in the droplets, leading again to four different clusters when both assays are combined. Again, 
When the clusters are identified in Quantisoft, the resulting quantification for each target is similar, whether the assays are done separately or in duplex. You can see this in the concentration chart to the right of the slide. Finally, to conclude, I'd like to hone back on the message that DDPCR is a sensitive and precise method that provides an absolute quantification for RNA molecules. It also affords a much better reproducibility for quantification of low abundance targets, something that is extremely useful when you're working with limited sample or single cells. It also gives a greater sensitivity for lower level changes in expressions. Finally, it provides unparalleled resolution for miRNA analysis, as was demonstrated here. And the capacity to multiplex with Evergreen makes analysis of target and reference in the same well possible using just one color. I um, have also included a series of papers that were mentioned here. You will be able to retrieve those using your um, regular browsing tools. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that engaging talk. If you would like a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation, a copy of the QX200 DDPCR brochure, DDPCR application notes on multiplexing and rare event detection, and the publications list, they are all available at the link to the left of your screen for download. The webinar is also available on demand within 24 hours. If you would like any additional information, please feel free to reach out to your local BioRad Droplet Digital PCR specialist as well. Jan will now take questions. Our first question is regarding a housekeeping microRNA in DDPCR analysis. Is there a need for housekeeping microRNAs? You mean in order to normalize the, the quantification of RNAs? Correct. So in, during DDPCR analysis, um, does a user need to use housekeeping or any sort of reference gene? I would say yes, just because in, in any experiment, you can never be sure of the amount of sample that you're actually inputting. Um, I know a lot of users quantify their RNA by um, spectrophotometry or um, nanodrop or other methods using intercalon dyes. But uh, that quantification only goes so far. It is always better to include um, a housekeeping gene. It does not need to be an miRNA. I, would, I can suggest many other genes, just to me make sure that you're normalizing that. Again, uh, this um, use of housekeeping genes is uh, um, obliviated when you're testing single cells. This is not something that you need because you control the input by sorting the number of cells that you want per, per well. But if you're testing any other type of sample, I would still recommend to have a reference. Uh, our second question is regarding standard deviation in gene expression. Uh, is the standard deviation much higher in gene expression studies compared to DNA mutation or CNV studies in DDPCR? Um, and two, if that's the case, why is that? That's a great question. Standard deviations in um, gene expression studies has always uh, have always been a little more um, pronounced, and part of the reason for that is due to the nature of the material that you're studying. RNA is extremely label, uh, labile. It's um, it's really uh, a very delicate material, and is subject to a much faster, in some cases, to a much faster turnaround than DNA. So um, from that respect, there can be a lot more variation associated with, uh, with that, depending on the target that you're studying. Of course, there are ways to control that, and that goes back to the idea of always having a reference gene. But uh, the standard deviations, um, I would say, all are, will always be a little greater in gene expression studies, which really makes the case for a tool that minimizes your um, confidence intervals. You know, by having a tool such as DDPCR, where the confidence of the quantification is much lower, 
you are minimizing the already greater um, de standard deviations that you will observe in gene expression studies. So our next question is regarding the 423 microRNA analysis data you showed. Um, a lot of rain was observed in this assay. What does this rain mean, and how is the analysis adjusted for correct absolute quantification? Um, so, first of all, I, I believe the rain that you mentioned was probably seen in the in the evergreen slide. Um, and uh, while I agree it might not be the best plot that I could find, I'm I'm sorry I. I I've, did not repeat the experiment for this. This was kind of a proof of concept experiment, but later experiments have shown much cleaner results. In any case, um, when you observe some rain or intermediate droplets, that's what is defined as rain, what you're basically observing is a, a minority of cases of, of uh, droplets where the PCR has not been completely efficient. So this can be linked to the of assay that you're performing or to the conditions in your sample. If you have some inhibitors present in the sample, what that might translate into is into some um, droplets where PCR is not 100% efficient. But, however, I do need to mention that rain is only a concern when it's extremely abundant and actually starts impairing the um, the positive cluster, the, the cluster of positive droplets. If you can not really see a defined positive cluster and you have a high abundance of uh, intermediate rain, then you have chances of that um, interfering with your quantification. If you have just a very moderate intermediate rain, uh, I would not worry too much about that. It, the quantification here is, dig is digital, it's binary, it's basically yes or no. So any droplets that are above your threshold will be counted as positive. So uh, if you have a certain number of intermediate um, droplets, as long as they're, count they're above the threshold, they will still be counted. So that should not interfere with your quantification too much. So our next question again is regarding SEM analysis. What do you recommend for calculation of results of replicates with different dilution factors? Oh, so calculation of results of replicates with different dilution factors. Um, that's a great question. Well, the dilution factor needs to be translated into, um, you need to carry over the dilution factor for the coefficient, uh, for the, the standard deviation that you observe. You know, if you dilute a sample a thousand fold or a hundred fold, uh, you have to apply that same factor to the, the standard deviation that you might observe in the, to the error that you might observe by DDPCR. Um, when you're calculating, we have methods actually, when you're doing triplicates actually, the, the Quantasoft software will calculate all those standard deviations. You just need to factor in the dilution afterwards. Uh, that's the one part that is not um, factored in by the software. But um, other than that, it's a very normal procedure. Just you know, make sure that you label your samples with the same name so that the software can recognize them as replicates. And uh, the software itself will give you the, the standard deviation that you need. So our next question is regarding optimization. How does one optimize the assay when rain is apparent? Again, um, another question about rain. And uh, so if you are observing large amounts of rain, if you are observing large amounts of intermediate uh, droplets, that will most usually reflect an assay that has not been completely optimized. So the, the PCR conditions are not quite there. In a lot of cases, this can be due to um, a, a poor temperature. The temperature that was chosen may not be the same. In some cases, actually, some people directly use the same temperature that they had for QRT-PCR and they, they translate the same to DDPCR. So uh, because the mixes that are used for both reactions are not the same, it is usually good to perform to start validating an assay by performing a temperature gradient. This allows you to really find out what the optimal temperature is, and you can go on with that. If you continue seeing intermediate rain, which in most cases uh, a temperature gradient solves the, that, 
But if you continue seeing uh, rain, that might reflect some problems with either the sample quality, so you might have some um, heavy inhibitors in the, in the sample, such as EDTA, or higher concentration, uh, too high concentration of EDTA, for instance, or residual phenol or um, other contaminants, or it might actually reflect um, a poor uh, design of the assay. And uh, for those cases, actually, I may point out the fact that BIORAD has now released um, several hundreds of uh, DDPCR validated assays. So depending on the application that you're looking for, I would recommend looking into the Prime PCR website and uh, choosing the tab DDPCR, and you might find an assay that suits your needs. So continuing along um, with the RAIN, uh, is RAIN is always seemed to be present in FFP and plasma samples. Are the results still useful? Yes, the results are useful. It all depends what kind of rain or how much rain you are getting. If uh, Again, this goes back to that first question. If you do not see a real cluster of positive droplets, if, you, if you're seeing so much intermediate uh, droplets that you cannot really see where they end up or they do not form a defined cluster, I would say your assay is not fully optimized and you have to restart it. If your assay has been optimized in other samples, you know that the conditions were well and the primers have been well designed. But in some samples, such as FFP or plasma-containing samples, you observe a, a large amount of rain. What I may suggest is to dilute those samples in order to reduce the concentration of whatever inhibitor might be in it. And uh, once you dilute it, you'll see that you will probably obtain, of course, less, dro uh, less positive droplets, but also less rain. The, the, whatever inhibitor might be um, left in those samples will be, will be diluted to, an, to a degree that no longer affects the PCR efficiency, and you just have to factor in the dilution, um, the dilution factor. That's it. Speaking of dilution, um, is there a need to dilute samples prior to analysis? This really goes back to what kind of genes you're analyzing. So, the QX200 system affords you a five log dynamic range. So that means that you can really, in one well, detect anywhere from one copy to 100,000 copies. Having said that, um, you really don't know how many copies of transcripts you can have, depending on which transcript you're studying. If you're studying a very highly expressed transcript, you may have tens of thousands of copies per cell. And if you're studying a very rare transcript, you can have maybe one or two transcripts per cell. So that really goes to back to knowing what your biological model is. And if you're studying a gene for the first time, I would definitely recommend testing at least two dilutions, you know, an undiluted sample and a sample diluted, maybe one in 100 or one in 1,000. In, in case the genes that you're studying are not expressed at too high a level, you might see that the first undiluted um, condition is uh, optimal, and then you can stick with that. But if you see that, they're, that you're out of range or that for one target you have no negative droplets, then that will tell you that you need to dilute when studying that specific target. Our next question is related to Evergreen. Uh, can we measure TM when we use Evergreen? <laughs> Can we measure TM? Um, no, we cannot measure per se. It's, uh, it's, I, I would not say that the, the profile that you'll get in Evergreen will allow you to determine the TM. Can you measure whether you're having uh, an optimal amplification? You can determine whether your amplification is, is optimal by, by the intensity that you'll get in Evergreen, yes. Evergreen will be directly correlated with the efficiency of your PCR reaction. Therefore, if you have a suboptimal PCR efficiency, you will have a lower fluorescence. It will not allow you to measure it per se, but it can still give you an indication. Our next question is related to DDPCR applications. Can the DDPCR technology be used for the study of single cell transcriptomes? Absolutely. DDPCR is very well suited for uh, single cell transcriptomics. The reason for that is because DDPCR affords a very high precision at uh, low levels, you know, for targets that are expressed at the very uh, low amounts. 
And this is the case when you're having a, a limiting biological sample, such as a single cell. Um, our experiments in-house have demonstrated that you can combine um, facts sorting with uh, DDPCR. You can uh, sort single cells directly into lysis buffers and uh, perform reverse transcriptase and then DDPCR with that same um, well. You can maintain everything in a 96-well format. We have a question regarding the droplet reader. Is the principle of a droplet reader the same as flow cytometry? It is very similar, yes, indeed. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's extremely similar to a flow cytometry uh, readout, except that in case, in, instead of an aqueous solution, the droplets actually flow in an oil uh, solution. But yes, the principles are very much the same. So the next question is regarding sample collection. Blood is often collected in tubes that contain EDTA, heparin, or citrate as anticoagulants. Are you aware of any coagulants that are not inhibiting DDPCR reactions? Uh, we actually have done several assays regarding that, and uh, Dr. Keith Jerome has a publication um, um, out there where he studies different um, different anticoagulants and their effects on, on DDPCR inhibition. What he found out was that uh, for several of them, um, including heparin, um, DDPCR afforded a much better uh, quantification of the targets, and he found that there was like a log difference in the dilution uh, factors between qPCR and DDPCR. So basically he compared side by side the same assays by qPCR and DDPCR and saw that he needed to dilute his samples roughly tenfold less uh, when testing uh, by DDPCR. Again, there are some inhibitors where at a certain concentration you will inhibit PCR no matter what, so the enzyme will just not work. And, uh, and it's kind of a case by case, but we have seen that over a large number of inhibitors, um, serum included, I've, I've done some experiments with dilution of serum, of human serum, uh, we, we see a much higher, higher tolerance to PCR inhibition by DDPCR. So our last question, again, is application-based. How many targets can be simultaneously detected, uh, referring to the multiplexing capacity of the technology? Well, if, uh, like I showed in this uh, presentation, if you're using uh, intercolon dye chemistry, such as Evergreen, you can now detect up to two targets per well. However, if, you, you, if you're using Pac-Man chemistries or probe-based chemistries, you can actually detect up to four targets per well. So that would allow you to perform studies on up to four targets or I mean, three targets and one reference or two targets and two references, depending on how you want to uh, design your experiment. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, everyone, for attending the fifth BioRad Droplet Digital PCR webinar today. Our last webinar will be in March, so please join us again next month. As a reminder, today's webinar will also be available on demand within the next 24 hours. For those of you who had questions we were not able to get to today, someone from Biorad will follow up with you in the next few weeks. For more information on Droplet Digital PCR and educational resources, visit www.biorad.com forward slash webinar. This URL is displayed to the left of the slide in your resources box. Thanks again and have a great rest of the day.